bless your heart. Are you ready? Are you ready to be inspired, to be encouraged, to be motivated? Are you ready to be live with Atlanta? Atlanta Live, that is. I am Dr. Michael Mosley, and I'm so happy, as always, to be here with the queen of my heart, Lady Anelia Wright Mosley. Darling, we're here again. We are here, and we're so excited about what God has in store for not only us here live, but you at home live, in your living room, wherever you are. I want to encourage you now, call your family. Tell them to log on right now. If they don't have cable, tell them to log on to www.watc.tv. TV. Now, if they do have cable, you call them and say, find WATC. We want them to tune in because God has a word for you and songs that's going to massage your heart on this night. So you better get ready. I am so grateful. Before we go into the worship and to the singing, we get an opportunity to talk with our musical guests on tonight, and we are so excited about it. Now, if I can get that last name correctly, I believe the anointing of God is going to flow. Come on, help me, Holy Ghost. Miss Don Bino. I got it right. Don Bino. Yes. Bless your heart, Sister Bino. How are you doing? I am well. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Now, tell, tell us, where, I, I want to know, where are you from? Originally, I'm from New York City, born and raised in the Bronx. In the Bronx? Uh, yes. Now, the people Bronx. tell me that people in the Bronx are mean. You're not mean, are you? No, <laughs> sir. Oh, God bless you. The Holy Ghost is in the Bronx, isn't he? Just... Yes, he is. And you've been, when did you start singing? I started singing at the age of two. I would hum everything back to my mother. And really? then I started singing at church. And after that, I started doing some jingles. Then I went to the high school of LaGuardia um, Music and Arts. Wow. Forming Arts High School in New York. Yes. Um, actually, my brother-in-law also went there as well. That's Alan Bino playing the keys for <laughs> me tonight. Bino. That's my brother-in-law. <laughs> and um, wonderful minister, elder at um, our church, which is East Point Church um, out in East Point, Georgia. Oh, really? And, uh, okay. Yeah, Pastor Anthony Carter is the pastor there. Wow. And uh, my family, my husband, Richard, my boys, my daughter. <laughs> shout Hi, guys. out to everybody. Shout everybody out to everybody. And everybody at the church family. And everybody back in New York, my old church, Bethel Gospel Assembly, where I was born and raised, and uh, really had a good time there. Who are some of the people that influenced your music? Uh, oh, my uh, goodness. It, it, it's, it's, it's everybody. I mean, everybody from the past, from at least Tremaine Hawk, to, I mean, B.B. B. B. and C.C. Winans, yes. um, the Winans family. Um, listen, everybody. <laughs> and then also currently, you know, there's William McDowell. There's so many different artists out now that are just wonderful. I love Tasha Cobbs Leonard. I, I love Kiara Sheard. I just, the Clark sisters, just Yay. all of them. You, just you, beautiful, there you beautiful. Go. So tell me, if um, someone wants to connect with you and they want to invite you to their event, their conference, or their, um, their business um, conference, how can they contact you? Okay, so right now, because of COVID, I did take my website down, so you can really find me on Instagram right now. Okay. You can um, message me at Dawn M. Bino. That's at Dawn M. Bino. That's B Y N O E. The E is silent. Wow. Awesome. Well, she's not going to be silent right now. <laughs> she's getting ready to usher us into the presence of God with her medley, I Belong to You. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Dawn Bino. Amen. <laughs>
will, I will sing of the goodness of God simply because I belong to you, God. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Dawn Bino, wasn't she powerful? I mean, it seemed like she was just speaking what I feel in my heart. God, he's been so faithful. He's been so good. I know some of you all there on this screen right now, you can identify with those lyrics because you know God has been faithful to you. Certainly. I was trying to hold back the tears so I don't mess up my makeup, okay? <laughs> but I thank God for those lyrics. It really ministered to me. Now, you may need personal ministry. Well, dial that number that's on your screen right now. Somebody is waiting and they're ready to pray with you and pray for you. And right now, I believe as we say in church, we're going higher. We're going higher into the presence of God. This next guest is a phenomenal, an outstanding man of God, yes. uh, a powerful musician, but more importantly, he is just a dynamic man of God. And I, we are just glad to have him here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome multi-Grammy Award winner, Reverend Mr. Dr. Kevin Bard. How you yes. doing? <laughs> I'm wonderful. How's the family mostly? God bless you. Wonderful. So glad to have you here. Now, there's a lot to talk about with you. <laughs> That's a lot. To, now, you know, you list yourself as a musicologist, which I like that. Yeah. Give me, what, what is your definition of that? Well, a musicologist is a gentleman who uh, works with uh, lawmakers, works with lawyers and artists, the in-between person that helps to prove the validity of a copyright. We just recently won a big case as a musicologist. Really? Yes, because someone had stolen somebody's work. So they call a musicologist, someone who, a doctor of music, if you will, and that person is the one who goes through some of the forensics of the, of the song, breaks down the song, the tempo, the key, uh, the signature, the flow, the ebb of the song, the verses, the courses, the, the vamp, and comes up with the diagnosis, if you will, or the synopsis, whether or not the song is an original or whether it was stolen. Now, I've heard that before. People say, they stole my song. <laughs> But what does that really mean? I, I, because I'm curious, did they take a lyric from another song or a verse from another song? What does that mean when somebody says, really, they stole their, their song? It can mean a number of things. It can mean you stole the musical composition as a whole. You might have stole just the chorus. You may have stole a lyric quality of the song, something within the lyric. Uh, if you recall a few years ago, Marvin Gaye's uh, estate sued a couple of people because they stole the vibe of a song. Mm. Not the lyrics, <laughs> not the melody, the vibe of the song, the spirit of the song, wow. and won almost eight million dollars. Wow! <laughs> I, you might be in the wrong cut. business. You might be in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> I need to join your business. I really do. Um, so now, God has richly blessed you. How long have you been? And I know everybody probably asks you this question, but how long have you been in the music ministry? Uh, almost, almost fifty years. Almost 50 years. You, you can't be. You look like you're 40. You look like you're yeah. okay. That's, I'm on the Benjamin Button plan. I'm going backwards. I'm, hey, I'm going backwards. I'm joining that team right yeah. there. Now, you, you're multiple, a multi-Grammy award winner. I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah. How did it, just humor me for a moment, how did it feel when you received that very first one? You know, what's interesting is uh, when you get into this, you don't get into it for the Grammys. You don't get into it for of any course. of that. When I started at age 11, I got into it for passion. I just wanted to play. I just wanted to play at church. I just wanted, my father was wow. a pastor. I just wanted to play. So you don't think about any of that. None of that matters. That's not even on the radar. So here we are later, you know, with all these years later, and all of these things are coming now. So honestly, by the time you finally win a Grammy, let me, let me, let me take the little air out of the balloon, because the way it actually happens, you don't win the Grammy right after the record. It may take a year, a year and a half sometime mm -hmm. before you get it. And think about how many records, how many sermons have you preached in a year and a half? Correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> before they honor you for the one you did a year yes. and a half ago. So <laughs> right. at the end of the day, by the time I got it, it's like, oh, oh. And, and then here's another formula that I figured out. When my wife and I would go to the award show, we would lose. So we've, we've lost not as many as we've won, but we've lost quite a few as well. Wow. So I figured out that when I stayed home, I would win. <laughs> so we just stopped going. <laughs> We stopped going. It was, it was a formula. It was a formula. I, I, I hear you. Oh. I want to um, find out from you, 
I had the opportunity to tap into one of your Bible studies. Mm. And I mean, I've seen you in the industry for years. Uh, who don't know your name? You cannot be in the music industry and not know Kevin. God Bond. is faithful. God is faithful. And um, but I heard you minister the word of God, and it was from, I would say, a place that um, how we talk about Jesus, how Him breaking it down, where pretty much a dummy could understand sure. just the principles of the word. Sure. And I was moved. I was so moved, and I was like, okay. He's just not a musician producer. Yeah. This is a true man of God. Yeah. How is your ministry going? It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Uh, we're, we're global. I mean, God has given us a global platform. We just spent 30 days, my wife and I, in, in Nigeria, as a matter of fact. That's why I'm wearing my traditional <laughs> Nigerian garment. Uh, yeah, they call it a native. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's been a, a great journey. It's been a great journey. And to see God move around age 20, 21, uh, on stages with Hawkins family. Uh, I just heard Don talking about that. Uh, on stages with the Hawkins family, I realized there was more. Mm. I just felt like there was more. I, you, you know how you get the one thing that you thought you wanted, and then you realize there's got to be something else. That's not it. Yeah. And that's the way it was for me. Uh, we would do a, 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 a seminar every year, and they would have a musician's class, and those guys would come in there and they would ask us, what did it feel like to play that chord? How did you feel when you played that on that record? And I was like, really? Is this, is this really what my journey is going to be like for the next 50 years? And I said, no, God, there has to be more. So I went back to my hotel room. This is pre-computers. This is pre-cell phone. This is pre-technology, uh, pre-internet. And I literally took the Bible that my late mother gave me and went through every scripture that said music, musician, song, singer, sung, uh, Levite, Levitical and did it by hand, mm. by hand. And I started that journey at age 21. Wow. And that journey has led me where I am now. So people look at us now and think that this is something new. He, he's transitioned since COVID. No, 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 no. Matter of fact, 90% of my calls are ministry calls where I'm standing up ministry, not sitting down ministry. Mm. The music has become for me the bait. The word is the meat. And I use it just that way. They use the name. I have no problem with using the name. Let's talk about the Grammys. Let's talk about the Stellars. Let's talk about the musicologists. Let's talk about all of that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what you're going to hear is a message about Jesus Christ. Because to me, that's the most integral message and it's the most important message. I teach in my daily Bible study on Clubhouse that you can't take anything to heaven with you. Think about that for a moment. We, we, we work hard to get the great car. We work to get the house. We work to get the clothes. We work to get the incredible jewelry and the red bottoms and the, the St. John and the custom suits. We work our whole life to get these things. Only for 2 Peter 3.10 to say that he's coming as a thief and he's going to rob you of all of that. Mm -hmm. Heaven and earth is going to pass away and everything that you worked your whole life for is going to burn up. Hmm. Jeez, what? Everything that I've slaved for is going to burn up, but there's a caveat. The only thing you can take to heaven with you is another soul. Mm. Wow. Is another soul. Another soul. So I'm teaching and training people across the globe, mm -hmm. everywhere I am, everywhere I go, to take one more with you. T take just one. Just take one with you. The Bible says heaven rejoices just over one. Make heaven throw a party today just because of one. Imagine if everyone in the kingdom just went after one. The sad fact is, and you know this as a pastor, you know this, that the greatest challenge for believers is to open our mouths and witness. Acts 1.8 talks about the, the word, after the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, yes. you shall receive power. But catch this, you don't receive power to shout. It didn't say you receive power to shout. It didn't say you receive power to dance. It didn't even say you received power to speak in tongues. That did happen in Acts 2, but that's not what it says. It says, it will give you power to become my witnesses. Yes. Mm -hmm. That word is the word martus. Martus mm -hmm. is where we get the word martyr from. In other words, you have to be willing to die to a little bit of you in order to take on all that he has for us. And my goal and my destiny is to make sure we make more believers. I need you to take just one.
Hallelujah. Just That's very powerful. And as you were speaking, I was actually just reading um, Acts, the 14th chapter, mm. um, with Paul and Barnabas when they uh, were out witnessing. And Barnabas was a Levite, you know. Yes. See, people say there, there are no more Levites, but Barnabas was a Levite. And he's the only Levite spoken of in the book of Acts, but he is a Levite. Now, Jesus did speak of it, but he's the only one that's literally from the tribe, but he also gave us the principle of what a Levite is. A Levite is one who serves. And, and, and that's the goal. That's really the goal at the end of the day. We want status, but really service is really Now, I know you have written probably more books, but I'm familiar with one of your books. Mm -hmm. Can you please tell us about your, your books? Sure. Uh, I, I've written a couple. I've probably got three to five in, inside of me. I've started two more that I've yet to finish because of my itinerary. Uh, the first book I did was A Servant's Guide from a Servant's Heart, Ministry from A to Z, where we took a letter and went through each of the letters of the alphabet from ability to boldness to confidence, dependability, esteem, faithfulness, uh, uh, humility, integrity, being just, kind, loving, meek, nameless, open-minded, all the way to zeal. Uh, that book is, is because I looked at the state of, the serv state of service in our country mm -hmm. and how people really don't want to serve. Not just in church, because we only really talk about service in church. But what about when you go to the, the restaurant? And, and, and I have, a, I have a, a five minute rule, if you will, when I go into a restaurant. The first thing you have to do is at least greet me. At least greet me. At least acknowledge my presence, that I'm here to serve your business. After that, by the time you get to your table and they bring in your water, they bring in all these things, the other thing is, by the time you've ordered your food, if the utensils are not there. And this is where it comes into the, the biblical context. Because oftentimes we're putting things on, on the table for God on a Sunday morning in our worship experiences, mm -hmm. but there are no utensils. So guess what? At the end of everything that you put on the table, the goal of the minister is to invite the sinner to come and dine. He can't eat if we haven't set the table properly. Mm -hmm. So the goal is for us to set the table. A Servant's Guide from a Servant's Heart. Another book we wrote was a book, um, a short book, an e-book that we did called What the Church Can Learn from the Musical Phenomenon, Hamilton. Hmm. I went to see the show, and there's some things I learned about the show. I'll give you one or two. Uh, uh, Hamilton scoured the country for years to find the best people to put on stage. <laughs> Do I need to tell you where I'm going with that? Mm, okay. <laughs> we go get mama and them. We get people who, who just any and everybody, whosoever will. We don't, and, and most of the people that we put on our church stages at times are usually because the main characters are absent. Mm. And then they have stand-in characters who don't know the script. And they fumble over the lines, and it changes that, the dynamic. The other thing about Hamilton is the show starts on time. Hmm. The show starts on time. They value people's time. Yes. They care enough to value. But it's 12 uh, axioms or maxims that I learned from the musical phenomenon Hamilton that I share in that small ebook. That is wow. awesome. Phenomenal. Awesome. Phenomenal. So I know that there are many musicians that are tuning in right now, what would you say the best piece of advice to them? Not, I mean, they may not be in the church, but what would be good advice as a producer, as someone that is le leading a charge to mentor other musicians? I would say go deeper, go deeper. Don't, don't accept everything at face value. Take your gifts, take your talents, go as far as you can take it. Um, we, we tend to listen to the radio and mimic what we hear. We, we, even pastors and leaders, we look at other people and we change our services to mimic them as well. No, God has created you, you're gifted, you're gifted, you're, uh, the Bible says you're, you're uh, uh, wonderfully made. Yes. You, you have your own fin uh, fingerprint, you have your own footprint, you have your own dynamics about your life. Uh, find what it is that makes you uniquely you. I, I was not accepted into all of my circles when I was growing up in Chicago, but what that did was drove me into my back room at my father's house with the upright piano, and it made me study. It made me become better by myself. And in becoming by myself, what I realized was I messed around and, and developed a style that the world now has embraced. Mm. But that would have never happened had I had the popularity, the notoriety immediately, and didn't work harder and go deeper. So I would say find your voice, find your, find your footprint, find your fingerprint, and then put it all over the world and allow people to come to it. So the way to do that, because that, the question comes, how do I find my voice? How do I find my niche mm -hmm. or my genre or my anointing is the word we use in church? Right. How would you suggest somebody to find that? 
Well, it, it starts with, first of all, identifying your passion. What is your passion? What are you most passionate about? And then it goes to that quote that we always say, what would you do if no one paid you? That's part of your passion as well. Yes. If you can find those things and tap into those things, number one. Then find out what it is that you're good at. What is it that you're good at? We, we, we've heard Bishop Jakes talk about Colonel Sanders was, was good at, at, at chicken. Nobody could cook chicken better than Colonel Sanders, even though somebody stole that recipe and ran with it, right? <laughs> and, and, and famous Amos with the cookies. Exactly. Same type of thing. Whatever it is that your niche is, I knew at an early age that my niche was music. So I started there, but that's not my only niche, as you see. Yes. So the secret is also establish yourself in other areas. I, I call it fishing in other ponds. Mm. Fish in other ponds. We, we in, the, in the Christian sector, we, we tend to find one niche and we stay there and we die there. Mm. Why? Why? I, I begin to look at Africa and look at all these other regions. And, and, and Africa was the one region that I had not been able to conquer. And I was like, God, what is it about Africa? And, and then what I found out was God didn't give that vision for Africa to me. He gave it to my wife as she was praying and studying one day. She came and said, uh, uh, Isaiah, I want to say it was around 55, where it said, uh, people will summon you by name that you don't know. Hmm. And I was like, babe, that's Africa. Hmm. And within a couple of years, the calls came from Africa. And now I've been to Nigeria probably 10, 20 times and, and been over to South Africa and other places in Africa, done records in Africa as well. So the secret is fish in other ponds. Don't, don't get stuck and don't get stagnated thinking that this is your one trick, your one trick pony. You only got one thing that you can do for the rest of your life. I totally disagree with that. I wear multiple hats from being a business owner to being an author, to being a producer, to being a, a songwriter, to being a, a, a musician still, to being a, an evangelist, to being a, a Bible teacher. Yes. Every day, and I love the chaos that it brings. Yes. I love the chaos. <laughs> I, because if I was only doing one thing, I would literally get bored. Yes. You know, I, I feel this for somebody. Uh, real quickly, I think there's a parent that is watching. And you just said something. Because sometimes we discourage young people that have a passion for music. Yes. And we're like, honey, that ain't going to pay you nothing. That's that ain't right. going to do. But if we encourage them. That's right. And then let them know that you can go further or yes. go deeper. Yes. There are other uh, avenues that you can go with That's right. your musical ability. That's right. So I believe you've just encouraged a parent yes. as well as a child or a teenager. Yes. Says, I believe I can make it in music now. No because question. Because some of us have that passion like you did. No question. As a child. No question. You, you were called to the piano, I believe. At age two, I stood on the organ bench at organ pedals at my mother's church. It was a humongous church, Canaan Baptist Church in Chicago, Illinois. E.E. E. Franklin was his name, Essex Elijah Franklin. I remember <laughs> it. He's gone on to be with the Lord, and a guy by the name of Eddie Spratley was the organist, a towering man. And here, this little kid, I walked up to the organ before service, and I, and I stood near the organ. <laughs> but during service, I stepped on the pedal. And the whole church just went in while the preacher was preaching. Wow. But the thing was, I was showing my mom and dad, I will play this one day. Yeah. I was showing them passion at an early age. Now, you tapped into something. I know my time is running low. You tapped into something very deep when you said that the difference between our generation and the generation now, the generation now, you can't push them into anything. Mm -hmm. right. They're going to go their own route. Yeah. We tried to send our kids to college. They've seen me as an entrepreneur for 30 years. They said, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm going your route, okay? <laughs> but the thing is, we identified their passion and we urged them toward their passions. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, the phenomenal. Please share with um, our listeners if they want to support uh, and, and um, be able to take, get your books, uh, your, um, I call it the risk game. That's what it is. Yeah, the That's risk what game. Is. Yeah. Where, what, yeah. what is your website? Uh, the risk game website is risk game, like the wrist on your hand, game, one word, risk game. Dot us. We did a, a stand on the Steve Harvey show there. That's, yes. It's all there. Uh, my website is kevinbond.com, where you can find everything. And then on social media, we're it's Kevin Bond everywhere. Right now, we got to go. I'm telling you, he's phenomenal. You awesome. got to check him out. But let's go back to Miss Don Bino. Jehovah is his name. Yeah. 
You're just holy. Now, I believe, I, I, I'm confident somebody is feeling, sensing, experiencing the presence of God right now where you are. Don't forget, dial that prayer line. Somebody is ready to pray with you. God is holy. He's all-powerful. He's ready to bless you, to empower you. We thank God for Miss Don Bino. Phenomenal psalmist unto the Lord. Now, darling, and we're ready to go hike. And, and before we even go to our amazing guests, I just want you to know those that need prayer, those that are believing God for more, those that know you're, you're waiting, you've prayed about something, and you are waiting for your breakthrough to come. I want you to know that God is right there with you right now. God said he would never put more on you than you can bear, and I promise you, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is going to come in the morning. I just felt in my spirit somebody needed to hear that because sometimes we go through so much trauma in our lives and sometimes we feel that God forgot about us. But I want you to know God haven't forgot about you. He's right there with his arms open up waiting to serve and to make sure you are taken good care of. Also, I just want to um, uh, mention Mr. Uh, Roy Bridges. We put you on the prayer list. We believe in God with you, and we believe that God is going to create a miracle in your life. Now we're going to go higher with our amazing, gifted, and anointed guests on tonight, none other than Miss Audrey Thomas and Mr. Joe Williams. Welcome them with us. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, you all are in the film industry. Yes. Now, when I, when, first thing, when I was uh, preparing to move to Atlanta, that's what everybody was saying, oh, the film industry is, <laughs> is, is busting wide open here in Georgia. <laughs> so so uh, give them a good shot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> but the film industry is, is phenomenal. And um, uh, so both of y'all are in, in, working in the film industry. Tell us, what, what is your company? What, do you, what is it that you all do in the film industry? We actually have a film festival. So we have filmmakers and screenwriters submitting their content to us in which we will go ahead and showcase them once a year in October, the first weekend of October, and showcase so their work. Up. It's coming up this coming weekend. Wow. So people bring their, their, their films and they you, submit. They, they submit, submit their, the yeah, yeah. And oh, we have okay. a, uh, a team that wash the films, grade the films, and the same with our screenwriters. But we take the screenwriters a little higher because they have an opportunity to have a table read. And so you get to see the actors and actress participate in the reading, in the dialogues. Now, in high school, I did acting. <laughs> Okay. But now, this is my real question. When you're writing a script, is it like you write a play? You got, Johnny, you say this, and Mary, you say this. Because I heard even my wife said she wanted to write a film. Right, right. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? John, this is what you say. Mary, this is what you say. Or is it in a book form? How, how is that? Well, you know, I'm more or less a screenwriter. I'm a writer. I've been a writer for years. And uh, exactly what you say is that you have to put it in some type of context where you can understand it and your cast can understand it as well so that you can follow the leader, if you will. So uh, wow. it's, it's, it's exciting. I mean, and one of the nice things about our film festival is the process means that you can't turn your film in the day before the festival starts. So <laughs> you actually have to turn it well in advance and we need at least three to four months to process that so that we can at least say, whether you are going to be in the film festival or you're not going to be in the film festival. And that is the hardest decision to make because so many people write good content and, and go through the monetary process of building the film and making the film and things like that. It's not an easy process. And I always tell people, because easy, everybody would be doing it. That's right. <laughs> so so I, I'm just curious. When we come to the film festival, we go see all the A's, those that got a great A. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much, pretty, pretty much, because it's true that when they submit their content, it really have to fit into the categories and have to follow the, uh, the guiding principles of what we stand for. So it's, it's very necessary that they um, submit under the content that we're looking for. And because ours is a family-friendly uh, film festival, a Christian film festival, then that's the way we have to receive their films. And a lot of times uh, we could get something that goes to the left and to the right. So it's very important that we watch every film and we read every script. 
So there's. I want to know how did you all get into the film industry? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Well, it, it's really kind of an interesting story. I think uh, you had one of your former guests that was here just earlier, and he talked about the process. Um, Audrey has always been into some level of entertainment. I owned a studio where I had people bringing, you know, their actual stage plays and stuff, and I identified early that I didn't want to do any stage plays. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do film, you know, because it seems like it'll last longer. Now, the stage plays, people make mistakes, but you have to keep going. But the way we did it, I studied <laughs> broadcast management. Yes. So my calling, I consider, and the passion that I have was always into film and, and television. Um, I'm from Detroit, so Motown was my center. And I always, when I first recognized it when I was in English, and I wasn't able to catch on to those Adam stories and things, and I told the teacher, why don't we act it out? Oh. I would be able to understand it better if we acted out in history. Show me the history instead of letting me just to read it and I can remember it. And so I remember ever since I was like eight years old, I knew that I wanted to go into film and television. And here I am today. So I study broadcast management and uh, we built the company, Driven Films. And then when the Lord put it on our spirit to take it to the next level, then we created a Kingdomwood Christian Film Festival. And then we recognized that it was a lot of people in Hollywood wasn't able to have their movies distributed. So when they heard about Kingdomwood, we got flooded with Hollywood coming to Kingdomwood. That is awesome. So it is the Kingdomwood Festival. Please share the dates again of this festival. It's actually Friday. This coming up October the 1st through the 3rd. So we're actually running Friday, Saturday, and Sunday that we have our festival. And it's going to be streaming, of course, but we're actually going to be at Joe's Church, First Christian Church of Atlanta, and it's in Tucker. So we're going to be out in the garden. So we have an opportunity to still show films. Um, the screenwriter's going to be online, but they're able to come and participate and network. I, I'm going to be debuting a film, two films myself. Joe is doing an opening night with a red carpet, and we're just going to have a good time. We're just going to trust in the Lord. That is awesome. So where can people go to, is, to register? Where, do you have a website? We do. If they go to Kingdomwood and not Hollywood, <laughs> they can go to our website at kingdomwood.com, and they can follow us. But if they're familiar with our distribution platform, and that's Bench Way at B I N G A W A W V E dot com, and they pull up Kingdomwood, then all of our movies are on that platform also. So they can go to two locations, but they can always come through the kingdom at Kingdomwood. That is awesome. So um, she mentioned your ministry. Tell us more about what else you do outside of film. <laughs> well, I mean, we'll be here all night. I have a, an organization called Men in the Kingdom. And I also have a boys' night out where sometimes we just want to get the men together and just have a good time and just talk about a lot of everything and fellowship and enjoy ourselves. So that has really grown from like 25 to like 75, and we do it once a month, and that's fun. And um, what we try to do is, is this, this, this industry is so big. It's just like all the, uh, the things that we have in, in the industry where there's so much money that's the government and the state of Georgia has and provides, we are trying to show the men how they can tap themselves into that to get some of that, that money that uh, the, you know, the state of Georgia has given out. But again, being a former elder of mm -hmm. my church um, and have pastored at Kingdomwood several times, I enjoy sharing the word. And, and I mean, it's just so much excitement, even with um, the movie that I just, uh, that I'm going to be premiering on Friday, it's all brand new people who've never been in the industry before. But they all had the Spirit of God inside of them. We, we don't allow profanity. It's, again, the entire family can come. And that's one of the things that we liked, how we built Kingdomwood, is that we wanted entire families to come. And uh, as I think I said to you guys earlier in the green room, <laughs> if, if everybody could do it, you know, so the key is not everybody can do this. So Joe is very busy. So he has stepped into, uh, or I pretty much introduced him into the film world. And I think because he always been in entertainment, then this was an area that we were able to really have a direction that we always wanted to 
participate in as far as reaching out to the next generation. And so what we have at Kingdomwood is to reach, teach, and inspire. So we have young people that comes under us, and I have quite a bit of mentors. I mean, I'm a mentor, but we have them coming in. And what we try to do is just teach them the way you know, from all different ones. One thing that we have in for uh, Kingdomwood is uh, Kingdomwood Kids. And the Center of Puppetry of Arts is actually going to be at our film festival. And we have a keynote speaker. Uh, he's the director for Sesame Street. And he's going to be there. And, and that's oh, Chuck I Vincent. Sesame. <laughs> 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 can't get, get, get <laughs> I know, with my babysitter. So, you know, it was such a, it was a really great to meet the director from there. And so we are very excited that he's actually going to be teaming up with the DP. So we're going to have two directors. These are workshops that's going to be taking place. But he will be kicking it off. And his whole focus is actually to reach young people before he can teach them. So we understand that Sesame Street is a lot of kids. And my, like I said, my daughter, that was my babysitter. But because of his knowledge and the things that he have, he want to be able to deliver this. So it's coming out through like a business-minded type of workshop. And that's what we need here, you know. So it might be a children's show, but behind the scene, it's a grown man have to take well, care of business. One thing that I, I want to congratulate you both on, yes. and I, I said it with the previous artists of the guests, I feel right now you are motivating someone to actually step into their thoughts, their dreams, because sometimes some fields you go into like, honey, there ain't no money in that. <laughs> you know, don't go there. And I remember when I was 18, you know, you, you uh, faced with this question, what are you going to be when you go, where are you going to go to college? Mm -hmm. Well, some people really do have a desire for entertainment, mm -hmm. uh, but that field is not as encouraged because in my day, mm -hmm. umpteen years ago, it was get your job at the post office. <laughs> <laughs> but, but even now, the post office ain't that strong. Right, right, right. right. But I really do, I want to congratulate and encourage and even push you to continue inspiring and motivating the minds of younger people and even older people, older adults, people. that are saying, hey, I, I really still want to try this. Yeah. I yeah. have a desire to try this. And so coming to this festival yes. will be a good way to network, oh, yes. to get an introduction, even to find out, take notes as to how did you do this? Yes. How can I do it and how can I make it better? So again, I want to say congratulations. Now that's coming up this weekend, right? This, co this coming weekend. And one other thing that I want to add is that Georgia Film Office have sponsored Kingdomwood. So they too are very, you know, involved in the film industry. So if you also want to take it into another business end, that their office, they have been sponsoring us for a couple of years. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows that the part of Georgia recognized Kingdomwood and what we're doing. So we really appreciate Lee Thomas for supporting us and allowing us to continue our vision for the next Amazing. generation. Yeah, it's awesome. I, Mr. Joe? And I'm a former board member of Georgia Production Partnership, and that's for the whole state of Georgia you know, and so forth. But uh, I want to go back because we said DP. And I want your audience to understand what a DP is, is a director of photo photography. And that is one of the key people in, when you're processing a movie because he goes behind the scenes to make sure all the shots are what the director wants. And that's what I am as a, as a director. And, it, and really, the same way with Audrey, it takes the pressure off of us that we can concentrate on the entire story and knowing that the DP has our back. So director of photography, semiotographer, you know, there's like several names you call, but that is probably one of the most key people when you're doing a film beyond the screenwriter and the writer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and, and you educated a lot of people on tonight. <laughs> a lot. I just need to know, I need to know, where can I audition? That's what I want to know. Come on, come on in, come on in, because we're but both now, shooting. Yes, so, so the other, the, the, and I really believe that you have inspired, and somebody like, let me get that film off my computer, let me see if it's still on here, on my hard drive. Uh, but now, so they can come and actually mm -hmm. see uh, what these films are about. Now, you said something to me in the green room. You said, now, I don't want to get confused when we say it's Christian-based or Christian uh, film, it is really real life. Real life. Uh, everything that I write is real life, but it has to have a spiritual connection to it, or I can't do it. It just, it does, it's not placed in my heart properly. In the same way with, with Audrey, some of the projects that she's working on, it has to have some level of basis that can connect with John Q. Public or Jane Q. Public. <laughs> so we don't want to just like you go watch the Ten Commandments, you know, like we did. Oh, no, it's, no, no. It's, go really, it's a real life situation. Yes, yeah, yes. what we're trying to do is really bring it to life where people can really accept where we are and not try to be 
false or you know not real but we do have films that will worship and deliver those messages too so we, know, we don't run from anything because everyone is at a different level so we welcome someone that have a, a film that want to show a ministry and they want to show that they can minister or pastor those um, films that come in and they reach someone and so we welcome everyone I don't turn anyone down because I believe that the Lord is sending someone here to see exactly that message so I don't belittle no film if it's not you know faith-based or if it's reality or whatever it is if someone may be in the audience or someone may be watching that's going to be delivered from those messages so I accept them all well that goes back to the reach teach and inspire you know part of our role as film festival curators is to help that individual who's writing and uh, we also have teams that come through and look at what they're doing and they try to help them develop it to get them on the right track it's just like being in a train you want to be on the train track you know and so forth but i also want to just say to uh first christian church uh, our, under the stewardship of uh, tom edmondson he allows me to be creative and to not only do my film work there, but also t that we can do the, the festival there. We've done it the last three years, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, they just opened it with open arms. We have a, gr a great team there, and I just want to make sure that we do, in fact, say that. Please. Awesome. Yeah. Can we pass again? Tom Edmondson. All right. Tom Edmondson. Tom, Tom. Ed Tom okay. Edmondson. We speak blessings over yes. the man of God and his family for being a servant and serving you all as you all serve all of the people that get a chance to experience your, your movies. Thank you so much. We appreciate um, I want to find out from you all, because you're very successful people, business people, how has prayer, prayer impacted your life? I'm going to go to the queen first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's really the only thing that's been keeping me going. Because <laughs> it is a lot of work, you know, and it takes a lot of people to really stick with you. And I, I have to give a shout out to the Kingdom with Women in film that I meet with them every month. And what we do is just express and the things that they have to offer and their talents. And we all get together. If it's on Zoom, we, we, they come together, we pray together. And I think prayer really works because there's so many things can block you or try to disturb you. But I wake up worshiping God and I thank you for my support team. And so I can't, I can't live without prayer. That's the first thing I do when I get up. Thank you so much. Mr. Joe, how has prayer impacted your life? I don't know that I would be able to be in this position right now without it. Um, I think about all the men who really need what men in the kingdom has to offer. And I mentioned earlier about boys night out. There's no swearing or profanity or any of those types of things. It's people asking, what can we do to help eat one another? And then what's, what's happened, and I noticed this over the past year, that they're working together. Mm. Whereas before, men being married, you know, having kids, going to work, having all these responsibilities, they need a night to blow steam off. Yes. And, it's, and it's good steam. It's good wow. steam. I congratulate you both. Yes. Uh, continue to do what you're doing. One more time before we leave, uh, the film festival is this weekend. This weekend. And where can we go to get uh, information? Is it, uh, is it tickets? or? There are, there are tickets. Where they can, can we go? go to kingdomwood.com and click on tickets, and they will see a list of things and a list of people who are going to be there. And we were just very excited that it's just really, it's just interesting when you think about the Kingdomwood kids that I think God just set us up by us having, you know, the center of puppetry is actually going to be there. Then we have the director of, of um, Sesame Street going to be there. And even though his business minded and going on, he still was, he just received an award this year. Wow. He was nominated in wow. January. So we have an award winner, director. Coming Ladies to and gentlemen, y'all need to come on. Got to come on. Come on, come on to the film festival. <laughs> and right, right now, right. <laughs> let us go back and enjoy the music ministry of Miss Don Bino. I'm safe and in his arms. arms. Amen. Because the Lord is my shepherd Don't you know that I have everything that I need He lets me rest in the meadow's grass And 
We bless God. I bless God. I pray that you have enjoyed the power of God tonight with all of our wonderful guests. And, and it is true that we are safe in his arms. And just to add, just to leave you with a thought, if you know you're safe, then think about this. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the child Why 
Should I feel lonely and long for heaven and, and, and home? When Jesus, when he is my portion, 